Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Skeptical Inquirer Presents. I'm Jim Underdown, your temporary host for today. Leanne could not be with us, so I'm taking over her duties. And today we have an extraordinary guest in Edzard Ernst. Now, I should tell you that today's uh, version of Skeptical Inquirer Presents is being pre recorded, so there will be no live questions while you are watching. We had to record this. Edzard is in France right now. I am in Los Angeles. So the, uh, the gap in time is a bit much to be doing live for anyone to actually be participating. So telepathically transmit the questions you would have asked me right now. And I will try to uh, ask Edzard as he's going. So he'll uh, give a little talk and maybe we'll have a little interaction in, in the meantime, and I'll try to anticipate any questions that you might have asked. So let's meet Edzard Ernst. He, is, he has studied psychology and medicine at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. In 1977, he qualified as a physician in Germany, where he also completed his MD and PhD theses. He was professor in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Hanover Medical School in Germany and head of the department at University of Vienna in Austria. He came to the University of Exeter in 1993 to establish the world's first chair in complementary medicine. But if you're pro complementary medicine, don't get too excited until after you hear him speak. Professor Ernst founded and edited three medical journals and has written for many publications, including the British Medical Journal, The Guardian, The Independent. He has published over a thousand papers in peer reviewed medical literature. He has lectured all over the world and given many, been given many awards. And during the last 25 years, Professor Ernst's research focused on the critical evaluation of most aspects of so-called alternative medicine, SCAM, S-C-A-M, and is one of the world's leading experts on this subject. Willkommen, Herr Doctor. Hi, hello. Nice, nice to be with you. Um, and, and, th and thank you for, for the nice introduction. I, I might just say a few more words about me to, to put things into context. Uh, I, I come from a medical family. My father was a doctor, my grandfather was a doctor, and my father, uh, like so many German doctors, used a little bit of um, alternative medicine, uh, uh, notably um, homeopathy. Um, our our uh, family doctor was a, a, a quite famous German homeopath. So I'm, I'm saying this because as I grew up, alternative medicine was just medicine for me. There, there was no difference. And then I studied, studied medicine at, at Munich, uh, and um, it became very clear that homeopathy, for instance, was not at all medicine. It, it, it couldn't possibly work. I remember uh, being taught by the pharmacology professor and then, lo and behold, uh, my very first job was in the, the in the only homeopathic hospital in in the whole of Germany at the time, and uh, it proved my pharmacology professor wrong. It did work. Uh, patients clearly did get better, uh, and and I'm saying this because it is important in the sense that it, it, it raised a lot of questions in, in, my, in my head, uh, which many years later, I endeavored to, to find the answers to. Um, after the homeopathic, homeopathic hospital, I, I pursued an entirely normal career, became a clinician. Then I, I had a career break in the sense that I, for the first time, went to, to England and worked in, in research. And, and that is important because it was an eye-opener. For the first time, 
I learned to think like like a scientist, uh, and I learned to think critically, because in medicine, would you believe it or not, we we hardly ha have time to to think, as medical students, as medics neither, and and we certainly don't have time to think critically. So for me, th this was novel, and very very important. Then, as you say, uh, I, I became professor in, in, in Hanover, then uh, head of department in, in Vienna. And the Viennese very quickly got terribly on my nerves. And, and I, I, I looked for um, possible other jobs. One day, I was reading The New Scientist, and, and there was the advertisement of a new chair in Exeter. So I went to the World Atlas and looked up where Exeter is. I applied and eventually I, I did get the, the, the job after some uh, toing and flowing. Um, and, and that was interesting because um, uh, I, I was delighted to be out of Vienna for, for a lot, lot of reasons, which could be another podcast really. But um, uh, I... At the same time, um, halved my salary, and uh, whereas in in Vienna I had about 120 staff, uh, in Exeter I had virtually nothing. So I had had to build up a research team of about 20 researchers, doctors, nurses, psychologists, uh, pharmacists. So very multidisciplinary. And I had to define what I would do with this chair because the expectation really in Exeter was that I, I might be teaching a lot. Uh, I might be teaching alternative therapists um, uh, uh, about their trade. I had no intention whatsoever to do that. Uh, and, and I defined my job as, as uh, uh, scrutinizing alternative medicine. For, for me, that, that was the only thing. You can possibly do with it on an academic level. You, you, you can't, uh, teaching nonsense will result in nonsense, uh, and uh, and and so forth. Uh, well, uh, to to cut a long story short, um, we built up a team. We published a lot, and a, a lot of the results were not at all uh, what some. Uh, proponents of alternative medicine ha had expected. And this is where Charles comes in. Prince Charles, um, he, he is Britain's, if not the world's, world's uh, most influential proponent of alternative medicine. And, and, and he showed an interest in my chair from the very beginning. He asked to, to, get, a, uh, to, to get a script of my inaugural lecture and so forth. Um, but, but there was never any personal contact. There was always indirect contact. So as we published our results, uh, paper after paper after paper, not confirming uh, and, and, and not showing what Charles and other advocates of alternative medicine were hoping for, um, tensions uh, emerged. Um, Charles had created... Uh, the Foundation for Integrated Medicine, a charity, and they were pushing uh, alternative medicine into the National Health Service. My attitude was, okay, uh, you can, you can, you can uh, integrate um, alternative treatments, but let's first check out whether they are safe and whether they are effective, and if they are effective for what conditions, and, and if and whether they are more effective than conventional conditions. So, so it really was much more complicated than Charles ever wanted. Uh, and and the tensions broke out, out, public tensions even. Uh, I, I criticized some of the work of his foundation and so forth. And then one day, uh, Charles decided that he would produce a, or would charge somebody to produce a document about the economical benefit of uh, 
using more alternative medicine within the National Health Service. And they involved me into that initially. I tried to help. Then almost in inevitably it became you know, to, to a breakup. And I said, you better erase my name from, from this document because uh, what you're doing is not science. And, and that was going to be released in parliament for politicians. So that's important because it wasn't peer reviewed. Uh, uh, and, and I had problems. I, I had a real tummy ache with, with that. They, they, for instance, recommended that 400 million could be saved uh, if GPs would use more homeopathy for asthma. Uh, to which I responded, you would also kill about 150 asthma patients per year. Um, so so it, it, it became an ethical issue. And one day the, the, the Times phoned me up, um, a, a journalist who I knew quite well and trusted, and he said, what about this report? Why, first, first of all, why are you not on it as the only professor of alternative medicine? S secondly, what is it all about? And I said, I, I can't tell you. I can tell you why I'm not on it because I, I, I withdrew from it. But um, I can't tell you the contents of, of, of the report because uh, of confidentiality, et cetera, et cetera. And he just laughed and said, you don't have to because it's in front of me. And, and he, he, he quoted from it. So I, I knew it was in front of him. So then I explained to him in some detail why I had withdrawn that, that the methodology was deeply flawed, et cetera, et cetera. But I didn't disclose any content because it wasn't necessary. The next day, it was uh, the title story of, of the Times and the man in charge, uh, Mr. Smallwood, uh, an economist, the author of the report, sent me an email, uh, just one sentence, said, I'll make sure you regret that. So uh, <laughs> then nothing much happened for a couple of months. And then I started regretting it because Charles filed a complaint with my uh, vice chancellor. The, the vice chancellor is the dean of, of the university in England and insisted that I be investigated for breach of confidence. So my university, instead of defending me, uh, aggressed me, uh, had a, uh, conducted a very, very unpleasant 13 months investigation. I had to take legal aid, legal, uh, lawyers against my own university, would you believe? And at the end, I was pronounced innocent as charged. But everything had broken down. My, my, my 20 staff uh, uh, contracts were not prolonged. I was pretty much on my own, and, and there were no more funds, and I resigned. Uh, I, I went into early retirement, basically. So the, um, but the charge was that you breached the confidentiality? Was that yeah. the actual charge? I, I don't understand why, you know, that what should, is going to eventually be a public document and should be transparent in the first place, why that would even be an issue. Because it wasn't yet published, and uh, it, it 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 wouldn't really have been an issue, but my comments were so damning, that made it an issue for them. I I I I, I said that they are uh, that they've produced a hair-raising, use, useless uh, document which should never see the day of light and should certainly not go into the hands of health politicians. So basically, I pulled the carpet from under their feet, and 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 the uh, the, the document fell very flat. It had absolutely, because of my intervention, had absolutely no effect, and and therefore Mr. Smallwood was very very angry. He probably was hoping for a knighthood, still hasn't got one. But uh, um, yeah, uh, by the way, speaking of knighthood, uh, the the dean of the the, fac uh, the dean of the university and the dean of my faculty both got knighthoods after they mistreated me in the way they did. Oh, uh, wow. uh, so so that, that's that's England for you. Um, but 
we, we're not supposed to talk about myself. This was just bringing the connection and bringing Charles into alternative medicine. He definitely is a, a very keen proponent uh, and has been a proponent for more than 40 years now uh, of alternative medicine. And um, I've met him twice without any personal interaction, but was introduced to him twice. Um, and um, yeah, um, uh, by the way, I, yeah, uh, I, I, I need to say that I, I was really not very keen on writing the book about Charles, uh, The Alternative Prince, because I waited 10 years hoping that somebody else would write it. It's an important story, no doubt. And that's why I eventually wrote it. But because of my, because of my history, I, I, I feared that it would sound, it would read like sour grapes, like a revenge action on, on my part. And this is why I leave these personal controversies out of the book. They are in a, in a different book if, if somebody is really interested. And, and that is, is my autobiography uh, called A Scientist in Wonderland. Uh, which I've published some uh, eight years ago or so. So, so the, the I'm I'm very keen to point out, and while writing uh, the book, I was very keen not to make it a personal issue between Charles and and me. Well, this your I mean your the research stands on its own. You you talk about the in the book, you go over all these different alternative medicines and address them on their own merits. It's really not about, I mean, it's about Charles in that he is promoting these things, but the research is, is standalone, right? Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of you to say so. That, that, that's exactly how I, I wanted to deal with the subject. Uh, basically, I go through his last 40 years, uh, highlight uh, every alternative modality that he has been supported, so, uh, try to, to explain his point of view and then contrast that with the, the, the science um, of, of what, what, whatever modality we are talking about. So, um, and, and, and Charles ha has a knack of Picking out alternative treatments, which are absolutely the most useless of them all, uh, because and I should mention that in in my thirty years of research, I did find quite a lot that does work. I, I know skeptics don't like to hear that, and and uh, they also like to see the world black and white, and like to to, to think that everything in alter, in under the umbrella of alternative medicine. Is absolute rubbish, but that's not true. So Charles could have picked out things uh, that he could have reasonably supported with good backing from evidence, but he didn't. Uh, and and the 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 best example and the treatment that is closest to his heart, no doubt, is homeopathy. Um, uh, homeopathy has been. Um, uh, a favorite of the royal family ever since Hahnemann invented it. Um, that there was an English doctor called Dr. Quinn. He went to see Hahnemann in, in Germany and learned homeopathy directly from the source. And, and this guy was well connected to aristocracy. And therefore, um, homeopathy has been at the heart of the British aristocracy from its very beginning. Um, and therefore, it's not really that surprising that Charles is a victim of homeopathy as well. But you were talking about um, something that's 200 years old and was invented essentially at a time where doctors were killing a lot of people in inadvertently. Yes, that, that, that's. That it explains the early success of, of homeopathy, um, be, because in in conventional medicine we were very often 
more dangerous than the disease. The doctors were more dangerous than the disease. And, and Hahnemann in, invented basically placebo treatment. And um, his patients were on dying like flies. So he, he was very successful, rightly so. Um, uh, uh, and if Hahnemann lived today, I, I think he was quite a clever doctor. Uh, he would probably condemn homeopathy uh, 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 more than anybody else. Today he would. <laughs> yes, today oh, that's he would. interesting. But anyway, that, to, to, to come back to, to, to Charles, um, I, f I forgot to mention that Charles and I are born in, 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 in the same year. So um, we have our birth year in common. We, ha we have other things in common as well. We, the German blood, of course. Charles, <laughs> Charles is, is, is an anglicized German. Uh, uh, we both had very st strong uh, mothers uh, who had to delegate education. We both uh, had to go to boarding school. We were both very unhappy at boarding school. Um, we both ha had a decent education, I think. Um, not, not trying to flatter either me or Charles, but uh, Charles probably did have a good education. He's, he studied art in Cambridge, where I now, where I now live when I'm in, in Britain. And, and that's important because, because his Bachelor of, of Art did not equip him very well to, to, to argue about science and, and, or, or argue about medicine. And for the last 40 years, he has argued about alternative medicine. Um, so what, what, what brought him on, on this path? Um, I, I think it was a guy called Lawrence van der Post. Lawrence van der Post was an, um, a writer, amongst other things, from South Africa, very well connected. Um, and he was a fantasist. He 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 was a, a notorious liar. Um, he um, he he was a pedophile. Uh, all this is proven. Uh, so, so I'm 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 not I'm I'm not slandering anybody here. And 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 he he uh, had enormous influence over over the young Prince Charles. He led him in into a world of mysticism. Of anti-science, of of uh, Jung's uh, uh, psychotherapy, and and opened a new world for for Charles, and I'm convinced that, that this were his first steps in into into the weird and wonderful world of alternative medicine. And uh, Charles' first outing. Uh, on, on 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 this score was ni 1982 when he was 34 only so a, a very young man and the british medical association felt that they sh uh, should appoint them uh, appoint him their president which is perhaps um understandable as as the future king of england but um was a serious mistake, <laughs> and he he on on this occasion he addressed the general assembly and pointed uh, out that the uh, medical profession had been uh, overtly hostile to alternative treatments. That medicine was l like the uh, l l leaning tower of Pisa. Um, uh, leaning in the wrong direction and and uh, threatening to crumble down, and he was uh, going going to straighten this out. In 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 other words, he he upset the medical establishment profoundly. Um, at, at a time when uh, medics in England were al already trying to accommodate a little bit of a, the ideas of alternative medicine. He made this ab abrupt break and uh, 
wasn't very helpful for the cause. You even, um, and and that is something that I notice often when looking at at Charles's life in alternative medicine. That even if you are a fanatic of alternative medicine, you ought to admit that he has done a lot of harm to to that cause by by. Uh, upsetting people by being unreasonable, by being anti-science and by being anti-evidence. So, um, yeah, um, the next thing he did uh, was to fight um, and bring about, fight for and bring about statutory regulation for chiropractic and osteopathy in the United Kingdom. Which is unusual because, because statutory regulation uh, um, means a, a lot of kudos and and um, as we probably all know, listening to this podcast, uh, neither the chiropractors nor the osteopaths, which by by the way in in, in Britain are very different from from the uh, uh, U.S. osteopaths, uh, de deserve that statute. Um, so uh, th that's recently went so far that um, the chiropractors now have a Royal College of Chiropractics, uh, which is not just unusual but ununderstandable. Uh, the, there are royal colleges of uh, general practice, royal colleges of all the other medical specialities, but there is unprecedented that an alternative uh, profession like chiropractic should have a royal college. And that clearly is um, Prince Charles's help. When they legitimized chiropractic, did, did they establish limits in terms of what they could treat or can they prescribe medicine you know what are their limitations they they do spinal manipulation spinal mobilization um, they do everything that um physiotherapists do but they're not allowed to prescribe medicine they 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 can uh, recommend and sell uh, supplements very much like like in america just to explain the the osteopaths in 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 America, osteopaths are basically trained like doctors and they can specialize like like doctors. In in the UK and and in in the whole of Europe, this is not the case. They are um, trained as uh, alternative practitioners and and haven't been through a proper medical training. I think that's quite important to point out. Back to Prince Charles, in, in, in 1993, um, the year when my chair was established, he, he created the Foundation for Integrated Health. Uh, it, uh, it changed its name several times, but I, I think in the end it, it was called uh, Foundation for Integrated Health. And, and this, is the, this is the organization I had lots to do with they came to my meetings we we had we we had research meetings in in Exeter annual research meetings for 15 years or so and so they contributed to that also financially um uh, they invited me to to their meetings etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, and and we often uh, disagreed mostly politely disagreed but uh, th there was Plenty of disagreement. As, as I said earlier, they wanted to integrate and I wanted to test. Um, and even though this is just one word difference, it, 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 it's a world of difference. Um, so, so the, the story of the Foundation for Integrated Health is, is very interesting because in, in 2010, it was closed very abruptly uh, after police investigation 
found that there was uh, fraud uh, and money laundering going on in, in that organization. <laughs> and that could be just a, a, a quirky little detail, but it, it probably is more because I've already spoken about Thunder Post. Um, and what I see uh, repeatedly in Charles's um, ambitions regarding alternative medicine is that he is such a poor judge of character. He, he surrounds himself with the wrong people. He surrounds himself with sycophants, uh, and, uh, 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 and that backfires qu quite regularly. And I, I think that might have also backfired with the money, money laundering question. Uh, the, the man who was responsible actually went to jail for it. Uh, so so it, it was a serious aff affair. Um, next, um, th there was a meeting in, in 2004 where uh, I was invited and 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 it was at one of the Royal Colleges, I think Royal College of Gynecology, and it, it was about cancer. So uh, some of the best oncologists of the UK were in the audience and, and Charles was going to speak, and you wouldn't believe what he does. He st stands at the podium and promotes Gerson therapy. Gerson therapy is a st starvation diet which basically hastens hastens the death of cancer patients. Not on, not only it hastens their death and reduces their quality of life, but also because the, the uh, treatment is very very hard to follow. Uh, then the Gerson people tell you, now you're dying of cancer, but it's your fault because you didn't follow properly the regimen. Uh, so it it is just about the most terrible cancer treatment that you can imagine. And and it's well known in, in Britain. And him standing there, I will never forget that. There, there, there was an icy silence in, in the room and people just couldn't, couldn't believe what this guy was saying and telling them. Um, a year later, 2005, um, it was it was disclosed uh, through the activities of, of the Guardian newspaper that Charles had written plenty of letters to politicians. And many of, of these letters to politicians were pushing for more alternative medicine within the NHS. Why is this remarkable? It's remarkable because uh, his constitutional role we don't have a written constitution, but the, his constitutional role uh, clearly says that he mustn't uh, he, he mustn't interfere in politics and and health politics. After all, is politics, and he did interfere um, uh, repeatedly. Well, not so, only does he disappear, but he or, or does he interfere, <clears throat> but he does so in a way that is antithetical to science and actually hurts the population in some form. I mean, yes. it's, it's worse than just meddling. He's on the wrong side of the meddling. Yes, yes. Otherwise, one wouldn't, one re wouldn't really object so much. In, on other issues, he, he's, he's on the side of the angels uh, he, with climate change and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the environment and, and so forth, um, but he's when he, when uh, more or less at, at the same time he speaks out for homeopathy and stuff like that, he undermines his own credibility, and and I know climate scientists who who say we wish Charles wouldn't speak. In, in favor of our cause because he's, he's doing us more damage. But anyway, um, yeah. Um, so, do, but do you, have any, uh, uh, do you have any sense of why he seems to listen to the science when it comes to climate change, 
but he won't listen to the science when it comes to alternative medicine. Why this schism? Yeah, in, he, he, he published a book himself with two co-authors or ghostwriters uh, in 2010, and he calls it Harmony. And I think that that book provides an answer to the question. He 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 searches for harmony and and balance, uh, and 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 nature uh, has to be left natural, and we shouldn't interfere to the extent we do interfere. And and that is when I say he's on the side of the angels, uh, maybe not exactly with the right motives, but it it. it it turns out he's he's on on the side of the angels, but with the, with the very similar motives, he promotes what he thinks is natural treatment and and ancient wisdom and 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 uh, uh, homeopathy and herbal medicine and 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 anything really the the treatments and diagnostic techniques that, that he has promoted in in the past 40, 40 years um, big i believe i'm i'm often just citing homeopathy but there's ayurvedic medicine there's uh, traditional chinese medicine there's pulse diagnosis which is a chinese type of diagnosis there's iridology which is making diagnosis by looking at the irises of of patients and it is so far way out that, as I say, it, it does beg a belief. Um, just maybe to finish off, I don't know how much time we have. In, in 2008, he took the biscuit by coming out uh, with uh, his own herbal tinctures. He, he has a firm that is called Dutchy Originals. Um, he he owns the, the Duchy of Cornwall, and and they used to produce biscuits and and uh, and all very biological and very natural um, products and uh, food stuff basically. And on two in two thousand eight, he comes out with three herbal tinctures, and one is called Duchy Original Detox Tincture. And it contains dandelion and, and uh, artichoke, dandelion and artichoke. And, and you, you, you can imagine my, my telephone was, was ringing hot with press asking me what I think about it. And I, I didn't think very highly about it. Um, and I called it dodgy originals. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like something you would um, put in your salad, uh, dandelion and artichoke. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you can, yeah, but you you cannot detoxify with it. That, 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 that I can can assure you. On top of it, it, it was hugely expensive. So um, that that was on on the market for a little while, and and then it had to be taken off because it was violating advertising standards regulation. Uh, so an, an, another quite visible defeat of Charles's uh, um, um, foray in, into alternative medicine, and 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 quite 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 funny, really, that the, the, the press took up my dodgy original detox tincture uh, in in a big way. So, uh, as. How, how much time do we have left? Do I, we... I think we have a little bit. We could let's let's chat a bit more because I have a few questions too. I, I mean, I what you just brought up in in this country would raise some questions if Charles gets in the business of alternative medicine himself, and then is also pushing politicians in that direction. There's a financial conflict of interest in his actions and that would be should be a problem yeah it it, it was a problem uh, uh, he he would of course say that that all all the profits from his detox tinctures etc goes to charity uh, 
but then if it if it goes in into his uh, charity for money laundering, it's not funny either. <laughs> but uh, it, it, the conflict of interest is undoubtedly there when 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 he writes to politicians, and and he was he was uh, widely criticised for doing that. Uh, he in in more recent times he has been more. A little bit more quiet, a little bit more quiet, and and I suspect when he becomes king, he will become very quiet about alternative medicine, uh, which doesn't mean that he loses his influence. He he will not make public pronouncements, but he he will pull strings uh, that we don't know about that are not visible to 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 us. So I, I I think he probably will uh, will continue his his work in alternative medicine. Now you mentioned that Charles seems to have this predilection for picking some of the more harmful alternative medicines, and you mentioned earlier that some of them actually aren't so bad or may actually do a little bit of good. What which ones do you have in mind when you say that? I give you some examples. Uh, the, the most obvious ones come from from uh, herbal medicine, which is not surprising. Uh, herbal medicines uh, or plants um, have been the origin of lots of our modern drugs. Plants contain, or many plants contain, molecules that are pharmacologically active. And a good example is St. John's wort, uh, which is uh, effective for mild to moderate de depression. And if you use it correctly in such a way that it can't interact with other prescribed medications, that, then it, that it's also much safer than conventional uh, antidepressants. So, so to me, that, that is a well-researched example, about 40 uh, high quality studies that that back it up uh, and um, other examples mind body therapies everybody speaks of mindfulness uh, i don't i don't know whether you would consider it an alternative treatment in the us but here in europe it, it is mostly considered an alternative therapy and and there's pretty good evidence. There's some evidence for hypnotherapy. There's some ev evidence for massage therapy. So much so that in Germany, um, it is considered mainstream treatment uh, used by physiotherapists and massage therapists. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I, I recently published a book. Um, in in um, for for Springer, uh, where I analyzed 150 different modalities, and um, maybe around 10 of these 150 uh, seem to be doing more good than harm. So that's why I like to uh, annoy skeptics by saying it's not all bad. <laughs> Okay, I have one more question, and I, I can ask you this because you've also studied psychology. In this country, we also have a problem with celebrities saying anti-scientific things. Gwyneth Paltrow has a whole line of wacky products. Uh, Robert Kennedy Jr. is an anti-vaxxer. The list, unfortunately, is quite large. But do you see any road to trying to curb some of these people, and this would apply to Prince Charles as well. Is there is there any way to convince them to either keep their mouths shut or co or consider studying the science or accepting the science? How do we get them to change? Well, if 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 I knew the answer to that question, I would have I, never had any disputes with Charles. <laughs> <laughs> I and I, I had always hoped that that, that because, because he showed a keen interest in in my post uh, that he 
and I would would have half an hour together and discuss these things. And I was initially confident that I could win him over. I, 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 the, the thing is, he everybody who knows him well, and I don't know him well, so I can't confirm that. Um, everybody who knows him well says uh, he's full of good intentions. So with all his influence and his good intentions, it, it would have been wonderful if he could have been won over and fought on the right side uh, uh, for the, the, the few things that are good in alternative medicine and certainly for rigorous science, etc. cetera. Uh, but it, it never... It never came um, about this this meeting, and from what I know today, if if you even slightly contradict Charles and and say Your Royal Highness, shouldn't one perhaps see this from a different angle? Uh, so your your office list, uh, you, you you're not you you cease to be you cease to be in. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, an advisor of Charles. So <clears throat> I don't think it happens, <clears throat> or would have happened. With Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, it certainly wouldn't happen because she is earning millions with that stuff, and 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 uh, I'm not even sure that she's dumb enough to believe what she's. In, in in what she's selling. Uh, I cannot Im imagine that anybody's dumb enough for that. Uh, so I, I credit her the intelligence of um, being very effective in exploiting people who are dumber than they are. But that's not an answer to your question. That's just an... <laughs> an excuse for, for not answering it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do say, and I, and I credit you for your attitude, you say in the book that um, it makes you sad because Charles's positions are, you consider them a missed opportunity. Yes, that is, that is the concluding paragraph. And I really mean that be, be, because when I started in 93 in, in, at Exeter, I was full of confidence. I, 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 not not only I was full of confidence that I would find l l lots of uh, effective stuff in, in uh, under the umbrella of alternative medicine, and I did find a little bit, not lots, but I was certainly full of confidence that I would have the royal support, uh, and and that would have made a lot of difference in terms of funding. Because one thing people say about our work at Exeter, they say this guy never did any clinical trials, which is not true. We did about 40 clinical trials, which is pretty good going. But clinical trials are so, um, they are not just important, but they're so expensive. And we just ran out of funding. When the the people who finance clinical trials give money to those guys who are most likely to produce a positive result. And that wasn't us. Yeah. The book is called Charles, the Alternative Prince, an Unauthorized Biography. It's by Edzard Ernst. Professor Ernst, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. It was great fun. <laughs>